And this reading is Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be reading from verse 18 through to 25, and that begins on page 1453, page 1453, Matthew 4, 18 to 25. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralysed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and the region across the Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Insight is Australia's leading forum for debate and powerful first person stories. It's a program on SBS, isn't it? And one of the delights that I have when we go on holidays is that we can watch it. And uh, we enjoy watching uh, some Insight programs. Uh, Jenny Brockie is um, a fairly fearsome woman uh, who asks questions that really make me squirm sometimes. I can't believe you ask that. Uh, but their aim is to get controversial topics, uh, topics about which people have misconceptions and to invite practitioners like medical experts or scientific experts, those who've experienced it, uh, people in, in a debate, and to expose some insight uh, about the topic. I, I watched a recent episode online and uh, there were people uh, arranged in that semicircle and she was out the front and then there were some experts. Uh, the questions asked were always provocative and the answers were unbelievably raw. Uh, some of the answers I thought, I cannot believe you're saying that on national television. Uh, but people opened up and we got an insight into the issue. What would insight look like if they invited Jesus? Who would they get to be the expert? Who would they exclude? Who would they include? What are the misconceptions that they might be dealing with? Now, as far as I know, there was no television in Galilee in those days, so it's a little anachronistic, but I think this is Matthew's version of insight. This is Matthew's version of insight where we get a look at a controversial figure about which there are many misconceptions and we look at some of the reactions and we're forced to have our own insight into this bloke Jesus and what he was on about. Let me pray and we're going to look at it together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for sitting in such comfort. Father, please help us to meet Jesus and his methods and the responses this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Matthew, if you recall, over the last few weeks has announced uh, that he's writing about a bloke called Jesus, about whom God said, this is the man who'll save the world. He'll rule the world in a way that I've always intended. He'll actually deal with human sin. We all like to make significant claims for our children and maybe even ourselves, but these are pretty significant claims, aren't they? Significant claims about a bloke who's been a carpenter for the last 15 years. Significant claims about a man that many people knew. But if you go through the birth records, they seem to back it up. If you look at the announcements and revelations made about him, there is an uncanny connection between what Jesus did and what God said over 700 years before. And then you've got that episode where he goes out into the desert and does something that no, one, no other human's done. He looks the devil in the eyes and says, go away, and the devil does. He starts his ministry, and we, we saw that last week, and he began in an unusual way by moving house and by speaking. And the speaking is important because there is darkness over the world because humans have rejected God. 
And now we see what he does in public in full view of everyone. We get an insight into his work and the responses made him. Now, I'm at point one on the outline. We, we mustn't view this as Matthew's summation of everything that Jesus did. This is not a summary of all of Jesus' work. I mean, just him living and breathing is his work, isn't it? The fact that he woke up every day and heart, soul and strength devoted single-mindedly to God, that, that's sinless, isn't it? That's part of his job. Oh, we don't cover that last seven days of his life where he goes to Jerusalem and has a five or six day battle with the religious authorities and they arrest him and unfairly condemn him and nail him to a cross, bury him and he rises from the dead. So this isn't everything about Jesus. It's really just his bread and butter work, what he did day to day. And on this day, Jesus was out walking. Look at verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I'll make you fishers of men. And once they left their net and followed him. Walking, Sea of Galilee, two brothers, fishermen, Simon, Peter, follow me, drop their nets, follow Jesus, career change. We're pretty familiar, aren't we? Your hope is that this will be a short sermon at this point because there's not much more we know about this, is it? We're very familiar with this passage. We know what Jesus did. He called, they followed, immediately they left. They left everything behind them and went after him. But I suspect, well, maybe I'm just speaking for myself. I learned a lot of stuff about this passage this week and I think it's worth going back over it in, in a little depth. Uh, the key player here is who? It's Jesus, isn't it? Jesus initiates everything. Jesus is the one who creates the stuff that takes place. He speaks, he commands. That's what God does, isn't it, in the Bible? When God speaks, something happens. Light, light. Earth, earth. Humans, humans. It's a very important connection to make, isn't it? Because right throughout the Bible, who creates, who initiates, who moves? Yeah, it's God, isn't it? That's what Jesus is doing here. Now, that's not necessarily the case in the culture of the day. If you're a Jewish rabbi, your students choose you. They work out whether they like what you say and then they attach themselves to you and they follow you around. Or if you're one of those communities that seems to have sprung up all over the desert, like the Dead Sea community, yeah, a kind of group of like-minded people get together and they work out that they want to escape society and they go and pitch ten in the desert. That's not the case with Jesus, is it? It's Jesus who initiates. He's the creative force here. And let me tell you, he's not operating in a vacuum. All of these men have met Jesus before. In fact, many of them have actually followed him before. If you go back and you look at John 1 and Luke 5 and match them with Matthew 4, at least Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist and probably his brother Peter. And the other blokes seem to have been connected in some way. And when John the Baptist says, as he's got his mates around him, says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who's standing right next to him? Andrew. And Andrew goes, I need to follow that man. And he tells Peter and there's uh, some of them, but they seem to have had second thoughts. I, I suspect that it happened sometime, and this is just me guessing, sometime after that first miracle at Cana when he turned the water into wine because they'd gone back fishing even after Jesus had showed them that miracle in Peter's boat. So whatever else is happening here, these men have already met Jesus. Then they've gone back to their trade and he's come to find them. And he talks to them. He calls them. There's nothing accidental about that. And it's effective, isn't it? Jesus' method is very clear. He calls and they follow. He calls and they follow. And these men become quite significant, don't they? 
They become the inner circle who seem to attend a lot of the really significant things Jesus does. But again, Jesus is following the pattern of God. God speaks and something's created. God speaks and something happens. It's effective. Uh, It changes the direction of these men's lives. Uh, They stay in the ballpark of fishing, don't they? A slightly different job description in modern terms. But they change. Uh, That's what will happen when you follow Jesus. It'll happen on a number of levels. On one level, uh, there's a radical change in priorities. There's a radical change in priorities. What am I going to do today? Now, they don't sell everything and, and, and put it all in the bank and follow Jesus, do they? Because we know later on in the biographies that they spend time in their boats. But their priority changes. Their priority now is follow Jesus, even when the fish are running, even when there is a significant financial opportunity, follow Jesus. It comes at a cost financially. It comes at a social cost. These men are locals. They've grown up here. They've been to school with your kids. They've hung out at town barbecues. You've watched them take on an apprenticeship and buy their first boat. They're locals. Can you imagine the cost when you find out that they've left a lucrative career and follow Jesus. There's a significant personal cost, isn't there? Perhaps their aims and aspirations have to change. Uh, Buying that next boat, maybe taking that loan, I might have to put that on hold. They've got a new priority. It's follow Jesus. Now notice it's not a list of priorities. There's one priority. What does that look like in all the various things I do? Follow Jesus. And their work changed too, didn't it? Their work changed. Now, we're familiar with that, aren't we? They move from catching fish to catching people. What does that really mean? What does that really mean? There's no conversions at this point, are there? There's no pattern, so to speak. In fact, these are the first people Jesus has called. So when Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, what's he talking about? I think he's actually referring to his Bible. What's his Bible? It's the Old Testament, isn't it? And if you look up the images for fishing in the Old Testament, let me tell you, they're not positive. A number of them will come up on the screen. The first one's from Jeremiah. I'm about to send for many fishermen, the Lord's declaration, and they'll fish for them. That's people, God's people. Then I'll send out for many hunters and they'll hunt them down on every mountain and hill and out of the clefts of the rocks. For my gaze takes in all their ways. They're not concealed from me. Their guilt is not hidden from my sight. That's positive, isn't it? Or let's go to Ezekiel where God's talking about a river that he has created. Fishermen will stand beside it from En Gedi to En Egalim. These will become places where nets are spread out to dry. Their fish will consist of many different kinds. That's people like the fish out of the Mediterranean Sea, yet its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They'll be left for salt. How about we go to Amos? We heard Amos, didn't we? He's talking to the self-satisfied middle-class women of Israel. Listen to this message, you cows of Bashan who are on the hill of Samaria, women who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring us something to drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, look, the days are coming when you will be taken away with hooks, every last one of you with fish hooks. How about Habakkuk? You, that's God, you have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like Marine creatures that have no ruler, the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, pull them all up with a hook and catch them in their dragnet and gather them in their fishing net. That's why they're glad and rejoice. That's interesting, isn't it? If you were to summarise the image of fishing in Jesus' Bible, our Old Testament, it's judgment. 
It's judgment. That turns the whole fishing for people on its head, doesn't it? But it goes hand in hand with salvation. That's why we had the reading from 2 Corinthians. You see, what's the message they'll take out? Right, Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, for some, that's a message of salvation. For others, it's judgment as they reject it. For some, it's the smell of new life. For others, it's the stench of a corpse. When these men follow Jesus, there's an edge to what they do. And it's the edge of salvation and judgment. The judgment's by the message, not by them. You notice that? And as they follow Jesus, that's what will happen. Well, the business partnership changes direction, doesn't it? Because the next two blokes he calls, verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They are in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. That, these four men, these two sets of brothers, were in a business partnership, a fishing co-op. And Jesus calls them, they follow him, and their priority changes. Well, the second insight, I'm at point two on the outline, is more as if Jesus had a drone and sent it up and you could get a look at the landscape. Uh, that was up close and personal. Uh, this is the more fish eye or bird's eye, isn't it? I shouldn't mix up my metaphors. A bird's eye view of what's going on. Look there in verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralysed. And he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and the region across the Jordan followed him. The region's limited, isn't it? It's Galilee, just that little area up the top. The extent of his work's not limited, is he? How, how much of Galilee does he miss? And not a bit. All, throughout. There's not a part of Galilee he misses. His method is pretty simple. He goes everywhere. Everywhere. And as you can tell from the people he mixes with, the people he deals with, he deals with all people as well, doesn't he? From every walk of life. And when he goes, he does three things. Did you notice them there? If you like your English grammar, they're the participles, the ING words. He's teaching. He goes into the synagogues, you know, those meeting places where the Jews gathered to hear God's word, to strengthen their national identity. He walks into those synagogues because you're allowed to if you're invited. And he speaks like he does in Luke 4 and says, everything God has promised is here today. And then he goes out and he preaches or proclaims. He goes out everywhere and says, hey, hey ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there's a new power in the universe and you've got to work out what to do with it. That's good news. It's always good when the good king comes back, isn't it? And then he heals. So people get a taste of what the kingdom of God looks like. It's, it's not broken, it's whole, isn't it? It's not sick, it's healthy. It's not in darkness, it's in light. It's not dead, it's alive. Uh, the crowds are massive. The crowds are massive. They flock to Jesus from all over the Roman province, even from over the river, over the levee bank, if you like. And as news spread, the crowds flocked, and Jesus' method is very simple. He's concerned for all, and he practices what he preaches. He's concerned for all, and he practices what he preaches. The, the order is important, though, because what will roll back the darkness God's word, God's word. The miracles display it, but it is the word of God that rolls back the darkness. So as we come to this bit and before we look at the response, how would you summarise Jesus' work and method? Well, he speaks. He initiates and he displays. He gathers and he's concerned for everyone, all people in all the area. 
But if you look at the responses, there's really two groups, aren't there? Point three on the outline. There's two groups. There's the disciples, the followers, and the spectators. Uh, the followers are clear. There's those two sets of brothers called by Jesus. They hear his command to follow, and they do. Uh, being a Christian is really that simple. It's hearing Jesus and following him. Now, there are many different lead-ups to that, all sorts of varieties in the Bible. Not everything has to follow this template. I mean, you could go down the saw line and persecute Christians and become a Christian. Or you could go down the Matthew line and you could be a tax collector and become a Christian. But the key is this. The thing in common is this. Jesus calls, you follow. Jesus calls and you follow. It's immediate. It's transformative. It's initiated by him and it can involve everyone. It'll cost. But when he calls, you follow. There's also the spectators, aren't there? They know a lot about him. They've read that morning's paper, they've seen the front page or they've hopped online and they've seen the, the clickbait and they've jumped in. They've gone out of town and they've watched him and they've enjoyed him and they've benefited like every good king with his whole realm. They've benefited from his rule. But really, they're just curious, aren't they? They're spectators. They've come for a gander. But the commitment isn't there. Now, I, I don't think... We can make massive generalisations. And I don't think we should make more of this than we should because when you read through Matthew, you'll, you'll see some more reactions, the active opposition or the apathy of who cares. But there is a distinction. There are followers and there are spectators. There are followers and there are spectators. I suspect that SBS will never put inside away, will they? Because there is always a controversial issue with misconception, isn't there? I mean, they're never going to run out of topics. And I think their aim is to put those topics there so some of our ideas can be confronted. I think the same could be said of Jesus. There are so many misconceptions about him, aren't there? So many varieties. So many differences. But really, these little verses should give us a bit of a guide, shouldn't they? This is Matthew's insight. Jesus is concerned for all people. Nothing could be clearer. All of Galilee and all people. Does he say, no, 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 your realness is not on my agenda today. I'm not going to that part of Galilee. Your skin colour isn't what I'm looking for. Now, he goes to all parts and talks to all people because let me tell you, every heart is sinful, all hearts are in darkness and everyone needs this word to roll it back, don't they? His method is very clear. He calls and he proclaims and he practices what he preaches. He gives them a taste of how good it is to move from death to life, from blind to sight, from darkness to light, from crippled to walking. Is that the picture we have of Jesus? Have we settled for something more, perhaps something a little less? You know, in, a, in a world that is morally bankrupt, don't we want a good bloke? to give us a moral compass? Perhaps we want to inflate him to the stance where he'll do any miracle we want. He'll solve every financial, physical or emotional need today. He's neither of those, is he? He's quite simple. He's God's king, come to roll back the darkness of sin by dealing with our hearts, by practising the kingdom. No more, no less. How do you respond to that? Are you a spectator? Curious, having a look. 
Have you heard a call? Follow me today. If you are following Jesus, are we proclaiming him? Are we saying to the world, there is a king on his throne who looks the devil in the eye and beats him? Repent. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this insight. Father, enable us to know this great and good news that Jesus has come to roll back the darkness, to be the king, to speak so that we can be saved. In his name we pray. Amen. Now as Peter makes his way up, any questions? Baxter and then Neil. And neither of these are paid advertisements. Yeah, mate. Yep. Sorry, what was that? Can someone? Yeah, yeah. Baxter, you, you like numbers, don't you? And you like noticing the patterns of numbers. No, I don't think there's any significance in the three. They're just the jobs Jesus did. It's a good thing to observe because little things in the Bible are worth paying attention to, aren't they? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Terrific. Mr. Hunt. Sorry, Reverend Hunt. <laughs> Uh, the image of, uh, see the image of uh, the fishes uh, there. Yep. Is there any sense in which you may have that possible as well? Like uh, Paul is saying, for your own around the stench. Yeah, so I, I think there is. I just don't think we're getting it yet. I think we get it later on in Matthew. I think actually he's, I, I actually think one of the things, and this is something I'm still thinking about, so I've got to be careful what I say. But I think one of the things Matthew wants us to get here is when the king comes, there is both judgment and life. That's always the way with the king, isn't it, when he comes into his territory? And so I think he wants us to get more of the flavour of the first bit at this point. I think when we get into the Sermon on the Mount, which we kick off next week, we start to see more of the saving bit, the life bit, where he talks about doing everything for us. So I think at this point, it's got more of that edge. Yeah. Does that answer your question? All right. Morning to you. Oh, Phil. Yes. Go for it. Jesus speaks. Yep. People respond not always in accord with what he speaks. Yep. Because he said, he said repent the kingdom of God is near. Not everybody repent. No, that's right. Yeah. So what's the difference? You said. So, so I think one of the things that we've got to be aware of, uh, th there's a clear division of labour. God is the one who initiates and people respond. Now, for us now, as we follow Jesus, that's a great relief, isn't it? Because we speak, it's up to God to do the initiating, the changing. The response is the thing where the division happens. And some will hear it and go, you're right, there's a new power in town and I need to turn around. Others will go, I'm quite satisfied with the power in charge in my life, which is me. That's where the judgment happens because that response stays in darkness. Does that touch a bit on what you're trying to say? Yep. All right, morning tea. How about that? We can ask questions then, is that right? Thank you.